Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter writes to a Christian body that's not identified by name. So it's called one of the general epistles. But he's writing to specific individuals, yet to all of God's church, because what he says today in the scriptures is what God still says to each one of us. He talks about the ransom price that his audience has undergone. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That was your ransom price also, of course. If you hearken back to the days when you were going through the catechism with a pastor at some time or another, when you were studying what it was like, if you came in from the outside, some of the things that Lutherans taught or grew up, then we're hearing it for years. As you read through some of the explanations that Luther pokes in for each one of the things that are included, you see that he was just cribbing from scripture all along. And so, when we come to the second article of the creed and confess our belief in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, Luther explained that by saying, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him, in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. And of course, every one of those explanations ends, this is most certainly true. It was certainly true, Back in the 1500s, as Luther was pulling these things together, and it's still true now. You were purchased with such a tremendously valuable thing that it doesn't compare, even to gold and silver, even to the most precious of metals, no matter how much of them have. Actually, this purchase price is even more precious than the air that you breathe and the water that you drink, two of the absolute essentials for maintaining any life at all. Because... You were purchased with the blood of God shed on the cross to pay for every one of your sins, to absolve you, to atone you, to make you one again with your Father. And that purchase price, obscenely expensive that it was, was the only thing that would do. And then Peter starts out by saying what they should be doing about it. Luther goes the other way around and says what was done and then what we should do about it, but they agree. Have faith toward God and then act like it in your everyday lives. Trusting in him and loving one another. And you can build that out as far as you want, but it all comes back to the same thing. Most of us act about as well as we value ourselves. Think about that. People who don't think much of themselves tend to get into what we might call self-destructive behavior. If they don't think much of themselves, then they assume that nobody else thinks much of them either, and they're more likely to try to impose their will on others, whether out of a sense of inadequacy or a sense of entitlement or whatever else. But when you remember that to God, you are as valuable as the blood his son shed for you. How can you have more value, more worth than that? Whatever you put on the other side of the scale isn't going to make it budge. That purchase price, that ransom, absolute and complete for you. 
And if you start thinking of yourself in that way, as a dear possession of God, a treasure exchanged for a treasure, the ransom, the swap, whatever you want to look at it at, paid for by Jesus for you, if you have that value before God, how do you exhibit that value in front of others? You can't do it arrogantly, can you? Because you didn't pay the price. You were not rich enough to even put a down payment on the price. God valued you, as we hear, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and suffered and died for the lost. God valued you so much that he made the payment before you were conceived, born, drew your first breath. Before any of the good and bad that happened in your life, God valued you and he knew you and he wanted you to be his through this sacrifice of Jesus. And as you trust in it, as you claim that sacrifice as your own, as you claim that ransom price, you are free to be God's child in everything that you say, think, and do. Doesn't that make you feel good? Of course, when you start devaluing yourself or devaluing the gift, then you start moving away from it. You don't have that sparkle anymore, do you? That gleam of precious treasure. And that's why God has given us word and sacrament that he might continue to bring us back into his house, to continue to forgive us our sins, to f continue to point us down the road to everlasting life. But it doesn't stop with you, me, others in the church. Jesus also spilled that blood for those who reject him, who deny him. Sometimes it has an effect in their lives, and we see it. Peter, in today's reading from Acts, that brackets the whole Pentecost event. Peter has just received the Holy Spirit. He comes out, and he starts the address, and it skips to where he starts cutting them to the quick. God proclaimed him Lord in Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus valued those people who wanted him arrested, who lied under oath, those who either went along with the crowd or actually maybe took bribes from those in authority to demand Barabbas rather than Jesus be freed, those who marched him out, those who mocked him along the way, those who taunted him on the cross, who divided up his clothes, those who walked by saying, he saved others, he can't save himself. If you're truly the Christ, come on down. He died for the worst and scummiest and lousiest people on earth. Because God values them also. And he doesn't want that treasure lost either. And so... If God values us this much, if God values them that much, what are we led to do? The guy who has a front yard that looks more like a wrecking yard. Everything's up on blocks, including maybe one of the dogs. Those who have pristine lawns mowed by hired help that seem to stretch on for acres. The rich and the poor, the old and the young. The outwardly evil and the outwardly good folks to have around. Every unbeliever, along with every believer, was assigned this value by God. And he wants us not only to see how he values us, how he treasures us, how he forgives us, cleanses us, wipes away the stain, repairs us when we break down. He also then loves others just as much, and he wants us to also. To go beyond kind words, and actually, if we bring words of comfort, to see if we also bring deeds of comfort. To slow down and take time and really listen when we say, how's it going? To see if it really is going 
quite as well as the words that first come out of their mouths. To care for one another. Of course, this is where the care and concern starts, isn't it? Like a little treasure box. All these precious jewels, these blood-bought children of God gathered together to love one another and to be encouraged then to go out and love others. And then you spread that throughout the world. Hearing the same message that Peter has here, and yet still the church sometimes forgets. There are definite places where we disagree with other Christians, but that should not have us at their throats. And there are, of course, places where non-Christians disagree with us, whether they're crass atheists, agnostics, or believers in false gods, but we are not called to hate them, to despise them, to make war against them. We're called to love them, to forgive them, and in everything that we have in our own power to bring Jesus to them, whether it's through our offerings for missionaries and evangelists, whether it's through our own words to people who wonder how is it that we can be so hopeful in a world that sometimes looks so hopeless. We've already sung about graves and how that's going to be our lot, but even that's not a real barrier, is it? Because you were ransomed from the grave that you don't even inhabit. God already paid for your way out before you find your way in. Before you're carried out of this building or another and laid wherever you have chosen as your place of rest, God already sees you coming out on the last day, healed and whole, finally in body, mind, and spirit, looking like the one who gave himself for you. Not just the image of the treasure that you sometimes see and usually don't, but the fullness of that treasure revealed to yourself, to God, and to everyone else. This ransom price, this precious treasure, this value that God places on you and on others is pure and absolute. You're way away from Satan. That's taken care of. Your every sin of thought, word, and deed, the things said and done, the things unsaid and undone, all of that paid for. The guilt, the shame that you might feel, shoved off to one side. If you still own guilt and shame, it's because you're holding on to them and not because God is holding them against you because Jesus paid for all of that. He adores you. You sparkle and shine in his eyes and he wants to see more and more of you. And finally, he wants to see you forgiver. All of his treasures gathered together in one place and living there in purity and innocence and peace forever. Christ who came from the peaceable throne at the right hand of God, now ascended to him, will come back. And he will bring us to this peaceable kingdom that is being prepared for us. This place with no sin, no death, no pain and suffering and sorrow. That's the value that God has placed in you and on you. Because the same blood shed by Christ is then the blood that washed over you in baptism. The blood with the body that you take to your lips in Holy Communion. That absolute, pure, holy treasure. Conceived of the Virgin Mary, born in Bethlehem. That is you. And as much as the Father loved Jesus and sent the angels to sing of him to the shepherds and sent the wise men to find him from afar, so God loves you and wants you focused on him and worshiping him and trusting in him and telling everyone you meet what a wonderful God and Savior you have. And what a wonderful value he has assigned to you and he has assigned to everyone else in your life. God grant that you embrace the treasure that you are and find ways to love those treasures all around you. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.